and here you have estimates of the cost per liter, and this is in the short term, the green bars, while the purple bar shows the cost in the long term. And then here you can see a relation between fuel prices in dollar per, per liter and uh, uh, oil price. So if you go to the next slide, the next thing here, we can see at what, what oil price level these fuels will be cost effective to produce. And as it's shown here, in the long term, it would require an oil price around $100 per barrel to make these fuels competitive. And this implies that they are rather much more costly than the uh, fossil liquid sources are presented in the previous slide, which were coming in around 20 to around $60 per barrel. So these fuels are still more costly. I should also mention that biofuels, even if they are very, very important and alternative, as you, and they have, but they have a range of problems with them, as you have heard, probably in the news that they increased, have an impact on increased food prices, as they cause emissions in the production and so on. And that, that is probably true, but I personally I believe, and the, most of the science say that m many of these problems can be mitigated, and it probably must, must be mitigated if biofuels will be a source, important source of, of fuel in the future. I will not talk much about electricity and hydrogen, but perhaps these, these fuels are seen as the main alternatives to liquid fuels in the very, very long run. But it's important to keep in mind that, uh, for example, electricity, if it's going to be used to, to generate electricity and fuel vehicles, and also or hydrogen is going to be generated in fuel vehicles, these are both energy carriers. And if they're going to make any sense from a climate perspective, they have to be produced by low-emitting primary energy sources, or preferably new renewable resources, or nuclear, or carbon some fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage. And the whole cost chains from producing this CO2 neutral electricity or hydrogen with the necessary infrastructure that is needed and the vehicles which are needed and so on are rather costly. So they are far from being cost effective alternatives to, to conventional oil as it is today. So this was just some background. Now I'll go into more in detail what I have studied myself to, and what I have done to analyze how the oil market may be affected by, by climate policies. So what I have done is that I have developed uh, a long-term model of the global liquid fuel market. Uh, it is a model uh, where OPEC is taken into account and also other liquid fuel producers. OPEC is assumed to have market power. It's a partial monopolist. It's behaving as a strategic leader in this model. The other liquid fuel producers, they use price-taking price -taking producers and they produce according to what price there is on the market. Uh, it's a simple model. It's, uh, the demand is globally aggregated, so it's one demand function for all, for all liquid fuels. Uh, but the producers are differentiated according to the costs and their, their carbon dioxide emissions in the production of the, the liquid fuel. So this, I'm just going to explain this model very briefly. It's a two-stage model, as I said. In the first stage, OPEC can take a decision on a dynamic limit price strategy and it decides on these limit prices in, in order to deter the, enter, enter of the enter, entrance into the market of the competitive fuels uh, in, a, in a way that maximizes own, OPEC's own profits. Uh, and in the second stage of the, this market, the, the market is shared according to, to game theory and according to an open loop canon Nash equilibrium. And I think the model that has been uh, discussed here before that most resemble this model Oh, it was not really discussed, but I think it was in a slide by Hiller before. He mentioned a model by Salant from the early 80s, and these models share some, some similarities with that model. Uh, and I should say that resource scarcity and scarcity rents in take, is taken into account here. So we have, we have these hoteling rents in this model, but we also have these monopoly rents within, generated within this model. And we assume a discount rate of 5% of in this model. So the liquid fuels we consider in this model, it is OPEX conventional oil. We have estimates of the, the resource base of it, this. We have estimates on the cost of producing the oil for, for in OPEC. We have non-OPEC conventional oil, with also resource estimates and, and cost estimates. Unconventional oil, which is a, where we have grouped tar sands and heavy oil. We have gas to liquids, coal to liquids. In this case, actually, um, coal to liquids category include uh, oil shale, because uh, 
the literature available when we made this uh, model, the cost characteristics and emission characteristics were rather similar for oil shale as for coal to liquids. And they have uh, base uh, biomass to liquids. And also some of what we call a carbon-free backstop that we have that is rep representing an eventual transition to, to hydrogen or electricity in the long run. We have tried to estimate the cost of this from a range of different resources. Of course, this is very uncertain because it depends on technologies that are not, still not yet mature, but we have tried to make estimates of this. And then we have a price elasticity of the model, uh, price elasticity of demand, which is minus 0 0.5. I think this is in the higher end of many uh, econometric estimates historically. And we have chosen to put it in the higher end since we do not include hybrid vehicles or plug-in vehicles or, or compressed natural gas, for example, in this model. So I think this is the reason to be on the rather safe side and put a high price elasticity of demand. And then we use this model to run different scenarios on carbon dioxide policies to see how the oil market and oil prices will be affected by these policies. So the scenario assumptions we have in this model, it is three different climate policy scenarios, or actually two climate policy scenarios and one baseline scenario. So the baseline scenario is no climate policy at all. The other one is a, what we call a three degree climate policy. That, being, that is that we would put the model, the emissions generated in the model on a, on a path that is compatible with the three degree target. And to generate such an emission path, we have assumed a global carbon dioxide price equal to $20 per ton of carbon that grows 5% per year from 2015 and onwards. And then we have something that we call a two degree climate policy, uh, which is generated by assuming a global carbon dioxide price of around $100 per ton of carbon, which is likely to grow by 5% uh, per year. Of course, these are very idealized assumptions. The, the real world policy doesn't look really like this, but one had to start somewhere, and the models should be seen as, not as projections or forecasts or anything like that, but rather as an advanced back of the envelope calculation to get a re rough sense of feeling of what kind of uh, results can you expect, and, it, and um, how will carbon dioxide prices uh, gener affect the fossil fuel markets? So remember that it's not a projection or forecast at all. It's a rather a tool to, to generate insights. And uh, yeah, so the policy can see be seen as a representation of a global coordinated carbon tax or a global uh, cap and trade system. And finally, in the end of when I presented the main results, I will also present results from a sensitivity analysis because there are a lot of things we do not include in the model. And uh, the things I will present here today is that what impact carbon capture and storage on upstream emissions, what impact would that have on the results, and also test for different demand elasticities. So let's go to the results of your own sick time. So let me start with the carbon dioxide emissions generated in the model. And this is carbon dioxide emissions from liquid fuels only. It's not the global total carbon dioxide emissions. They're those who are generated from liquid fuel production and liquid fuel use. And in all three cases, it starts around 30 and 40 uh, gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide per year today. And then it subsequently grows over uh, the century. And as I said before, we have a long-term perspective and are choosing to, to present results up to 2017. Uh, and in the baseline, the emissions grow quite extensively over time. Uh, I will come back to the reason why it does that soon. While in the other two cases, what I call the three degree case, the emissions more or less stabilizes over time. And in the two degree case, the emissions decline uh, over time and eventually it reaches zero around 2080. So let me go in and present the actual supply mix generated in this model. So you have a sense of feeling how, what kind of results you would get out from it. So here we see the supply mix generated in the no policy case where there are no climate policies at all. Uh, I, today, the market is shared by OPEC, which is the red one, and the green one is non-OPEC conventional supply. And over time, OPEC's share of the market increases, as it does in also OPEC's own analysis and the analysis from International Energy Agency and Energy Information Agency and so on. 
So the, the OPEC scenario is roughly in line with these other uh, scenarios. The conventional oil uh, in our model is actually reduced somewhat over time, and this is due to resource scarcity in the model and that we have constraint on uh, how, in what, in what way or what path the production declines over time when you're approaching resource scarcity. And then along the way, you get the alternatives coming in. So you see unconventional oil expand, expanding quite rapidly. And it takes a large market share around 2050. And uh, later you have coal to liquids and also gas to liquids coming in in this model. And they're more or less coming in according to what the, costs, what the cost estimates we, we have assumed. So if we go to uh, the, the weaker policy, this, what we call a three degree policy, the picture is somewhat different. The demand is reduced since the consumer price of the fossil fuels increases due to the taxes. Uh, coal to liquids hardly doesn't come into the market at all. You see a little black in the end. And uh, the production by OPEC and non-OPEC -conven non conventional producers are roughly the same. Uh, unconventional oil is also roughly the same. But you see an introduction of, of biofuel coming in. And also you see this carbon-free backstop coming in in the end. And then of the supply mix graphs, let's go to the, the two degree case. And here the picture when it comes to OPEC and OPEC non, the non-OPEC conventional is roughly the same, but you see a much smaller expansion of, of, of unconventional oil, the biomass coming in earlier, and also these, these, our carbon free backstop, which is a representation of hydrogen electricity, comes in much more aggressively. But Perhaps this is, this is more interesting. When it comes to, 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 to the optimal strategy but, but from OPEC's side in this model, uh, as I mentioned before, OPEC has two different ways. It could either use a dynamic limit, price, limit pricing strategy or share and, share and then share the market with, with the other producers. And the, uh, the no policy case is the blue one, the blue path here. And the three degree policy case, which was the weaker climate policy, it cuts back on production to, in order to maintain the price uh, at a rather same, similar level as in the no, po no policy case. But while in the, the, the stringent climate policy case, the strategy, the optimal strategy for OPEC generated in the model is actually to increase its production instead of cut back even more and actually give up defending a price and go instead for a lower price. And the reason why that happens in the model is that it would be beneficial from OPEC uh, to, to use up its oil and exploit its oil more rapidly in order to avoid to have much resources left when climate policies become more stringent and carbon dioxide prices become very high. So that is the reason why you see an increase in production for the stringent climate policy case instead of a decrease as would be perhaps we have been expected. And this now comes to the, the producer price of oil, the, the, the world market price or the untax price of oil generated in this model. And it it's, it's shows an, an oil price around $80 per barrel uh, in this model. And the blue one is the, the no policy case. And then if you go to this weaker climate policy case, the three degree policy case, you actually see a slight increase in the world market price of oil.